Hello and welcome to another episode of the DJ Project Criterion Collection. And here we're going to talk about Spying 363, Mouchette, directed by Robert Bresson, 1967. Now before I get into it, I was thinking about the last Bresson film that I talked about, Alhazar Balthazar. Um, and I felt, and there was a part of me that felt like I didn't really talk about the film enough, or that I, I felt that it... I really didn't give it enough justice. And part of it was that, honestly, it's been a while since I've seen it. Um, but, but then again, but after watching Mouchette, because this is a film that I haven't seen as often as I, as I have compared to, uh, say, Alhazar Balbazar, um, I then realized that maybe, maybe it was a good thing that I didn't <laughs> talk that much, because the thing about Brisson's films is that it's it almost has to be experienced more than described. It's almost like trying to describe a painting. I can point out details, but really in the end you really have to experience it from beginning to end. Um, now with Mouchette, the it Mouchette is a uh, is a teenage girl, um, peasant girl. Uh, her mother is dying. Her father and her brother are well. Her father kind of neglects her and and often abuses her every now and then, or uh, not ravish not ravishingly, but but certainly is quite neglectful uh, and scornful at times and. Um, she's, you know, she, she's living in squalor and poverty and she's living in the midst of a, of a morally indifferent, uh, French village. And over the course of, and, and when you see the film, she has two major awakenings in life. One deals with sex and the other deals with death. And, um... Even though Bresson has this reputation of being a transcendental filmmaker and dealing with spiritual things, this is quite bleak. <laughs> this is very bleak. There is little to no redemption in this thing at all. In fact, uh, Bresson was uh, once, uh, he, was, he was interviewed right around the time he was making this, and he mentioned that this film seems to be in solidarity with evil. So, if you wanted to take the spiritual component, that this is that this whole film is looking at the nature of evil. <laughs> so, in that sense, it's spiritual in that sense. Um, but you know, don't look for any kind of redemption. I mean, at least with Alhazar Balthazar, you kind of get the sense that there is some possible redemption. But um, it still it still is quite bleak. But this is very bleak. I mean, that's really it, but I figured that this, because this will be the last time that I talk about Bresson, I think it's a, I think it's a good opportunity to talk a little bit more explicitly about his style and what motivated his style, what, what, what drove it to be. I mentioned some aspects of it. There's, um, there's the casting of unknowns. He thinks he hates using the term actors. He prefers models. Uh, he shoots with a 50 millimeter lens most of the time because it simulates human vision. Um, there's a lot of uh, narrative ellipses that are that are put in there. You have to infer a lot of action. Not everything is explicitly stated. Uh, there is a <coughs> There's a there's a strong emphasis on sound, uh, which to him is um, is actually it's it's dialogue and effects and music all into one. And eventually he would use he would kind of skew music altogether. Um, and whenever and at certain moments, whenever there are um, scenes of action with with no dialogue and and you don't have the necessity of seeing someone in medium shot, there is a medium close-up of appendages. So if you have a character that is, you know, 
takes something out of his pocket and then places it on the table. The camera, instead of focusing entirely on me doing the action, the emphasis is more placed on the hand, so it's almost like doing that. Um, and so you, you see more appendages. In fact, because recently um, the uh, uh, film historian who specializes in Japanese cinema, Donald Ritchie, uh, he recently died. But, but interestingly, he appears, uh, he did a video interview for Alhazar Balthazar. And in the interview, he gave this, he gave this joke that he heard about Rassan. And the joke goes, uh, so Brisson, um, is was commissioned to, uh, was, was hired to do a film based on the Bible. And so what he decides to do is Noah's Ark. And this production was quite large scale. You know, he builds the Ark, he gets lots of animals by twos and sets it all up, sets up the cameras and everything. And, sets it all up and rehearses everything and then he says but well, by the way you know we're just going to be filming your feet the whole time so <laughs> there you go now all of that is is more the details but what's the point of doing all of this um as i've as i stated earlier uh brisson in his mind and by the way he wrote he wrote down all of this in his books notes notes on the cinematographer uh, he makes a distinction between two different types of cinema. When he uses the term cinema, it's conventional mainstream cinema. And in his mind, that kind of cinema is more film theater, where basically you just use all the conventions of theater, um, dramatic structure, characters, motivation, um, conflict, all the elements that make up drama and theater, but you, you put it onto film. So essentially you're filming theater. And to him, it's not, you know, that's, that's not really what cinema can, can really be. That's not really cinema to him. Um, because all, all it is is just uh, using one art discipline in service of another art discipline. Whereas his kind of cinema, he calls cinematographique, where it's and it's it can it can be translated as cinematography, but it's not so much image. It's not just image. To him, cinematographique is where it's this combination of image and sound. And again, with sound, he he lumps dialogue, sound effects, and music that work together, it's them alone that services a greater whole and does not necessarily have to follow the conventions of theater. So in other words, this is, this is a pure art form in his mind. And he can also take it further. Um, he points out that, he, that um, it was Degas who talked about that the muses never talk with each other, but they dance. And in his mind, the muse of cinema and the muse of literature shouldn't really get along. But the muse of painting and the muse of cinema can get along very well. And yeah, that's the thing. that They can dance with each other, they can be friends. And so he can see cinema and painting being friends. And so there's the emphasis of music, oh, sorry, the emphasis of, of image and visuals. And so, so for him, instead of having a, a straightforward narrative or to have a, a, a clear narrative, it's more about a, well, it's about two, th I think it's about two things. Um, one is the moment itself and it's more, and it's more abstract rather than trying to convey something. It's, it's, it's more in the movement. So it's, it's a, it's a very, it's approached in a very abstract way, but the combination of the image itself and then the juxtaposition of other images and how it works to a whole, um, there are little motifs and themes and 
and reoccurring elements that help to uh, inform what what the whole thing is about. And even though he had this, even though he has skewed music and probably didn't think too much about music, a lot of that approach does sound very musical to me because, again, a composer is, and particularly a composer who thinks dramatically, which I know is is kind of heretical on the part of talking about Brisson, uh, is aware of themes and motifs and would try to uh, use those to a particular effect to reinforce certain things. And, and um, so there is kind of a musical element to it as well. But for Bresson, he was really interested in um, cinema as its own art form and that it should go in this <clears throat> particular direction. Now, does this mean that all of cinema should, should be more cinematographic? I don't think so. And just like I said, with, just, like, just like I stated before, cinema in general, and I would include cinematographic, is a very malleable medium. It's adaptable. And it's, and actually, cinema as a whole is, can be very rich the more possibilities is there. That's what I, that's what I personally believe. And that's what I've taken it upon myself to learn as much about cinema as I can. And to learn about not just particular directors and particular films, but just a lot of possibilities. And that's why I take an interest in avant-garde and experimental films, because they, again, they showcase possibilities. And it's just being aware of, just like with music, the more aware you are of different musics, the, uh, the richer your compositions, your own compositions can be. I say, the, I, I say the same thing with cinema. And plus, when you ins it's the moment you insist that cinema has to conform to a particular set of principles, that's when you start, that's when you, you turn the art discipline into something tyrannical. And that's, I, I can't, ex I, I can't accept that, certainly. And I think a lot of other artists wouldn't accept that as well. As soon as they start imposing standards and saying this is exactly what cinema has to be, then you get into trouble. And I don't know if that's what Brisson wanted. I don't think that's what he wanted, but I think certainly for himself, this is what he was interested in. And he made the kind of, he made the kind of cinema he wanted to make. And because of this, the rest of us are grateful because it, it showcases a different possibility. But if he were to insist that all of cinema should conform to this or that cinema should shut away that aspect, then I think we lose something because, and, and to make the kind of blanket, and of course he's, he sets this up to to show what, what he was thinking in terms of, of his cinematic approach. It was the way of, of, it's a way of describing it. But at the same time, it's also, it can be unfair uh, to label cinema in such broad terms and also to imply that somehow it's weaker or inferior. Because um, if you know enough about cinematic history, there are plenty of directors that are, that are informed or were informed by the theater tradition and were able to make some really interesting additions to cinema and understood that cinema was its own art form. The best example of this, Ingmar Bergman. Um, the theater aspect of him never went away, but he also understood that cinema was more than just film theater and that it, you know, it is about image, it is about editing, it is about conveying these things and so he didn't have to he didn't have to take necessarily he didn't necessarily have to take the approach that Brisson did but I would say that while he may not have reached exactly the same kind of thing because this is the other thing that characterizes Brisson but okay I just want to finish this one little thought even though um, it may not be exactly like Brisson there I think he did reach some uh, I think he did read some levels on, read some things kind of on the level of Brisson. 
and particularly in terms of transcendence and conveying ideas and going beyond just conveying drama. But uh, at any rate, now the other thing that characterizes Brisson, and this is why it's almost it's almost nearly impossible to really talk about his films and why I, th I think it, 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 it should be best experienced is that technically there is a minimalism, but it's not minimal for the sake of, of just pure sparity. It's, it's um, a better way of describing it is it's a, it's a minimal maximalism is what he's doing, where he stripped down the technical elements to pretty much its bare essentials and trying to eliminate enough uh, extraneous uh, extraneous additions or extraneous things that, that don't really need to be there. Try to be as lean and sparse as possible. But not to point out that it's sparse, but in order to convey a lot of information. And I think that's probably what Bersana was really, really getting at, is that he understood that image can image itself conveys a lot of information sound conveys a lot of information in a very short amount of time you can say everything it's amazing what you can say in about five seconds of footage <laughs> of combining image and sound and for person it's there's a kind of efficiency to it why spend why spend two minutes of theater driven dialogue when you can convey the same information and if not more information than just five seconds. And so for him it's not, actions are not, they don't have the motivating factor and it's not about motivation or character motivation. It's, it's more to, um, it's more to convey, um, I think it does two things. One, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's to generate an abstract, it's, or it's, it's to reflect abstract intuition, I think it's probably the best way to say this. And the other is to um, conjure other ideas about what it can be in a larger sense. And so instead of just focusing it narrowly on a single narrative, it's, um, instead of having everything be focused on the narrative, the narrative, in a, in a slim way, evokes something larger and, and more grand. Um, in a sense, almost like an icon. And, and this is partly why you can, you can say that Brisson is a transcendental filmmaker or, or a spiritual filmmaker. Again, he was... Uh, I mean, he was he was brought up Catholic, and even more so, he was brought up uh, as a Jainist <laughs> Catholic. Which, uh, if you know anything about uh, if you know anything about Christian uh, uh, theology and Christian and, and history of Western Christianity, it's 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 its own uh, can of worms uh, in in terms of the Catholic Church. But <laughs> nonetheless, that. Whether he continued to practice it in his life or not, um, those aspects certainly informed a lot of his works. And by the way, Mouchette was another adaptation of a George Bernanos novel, the other one being Diary of a Country Priest. And so there are also some carryovers in, in that respect. So... Um, Again, um, I I, th I still think that probably the best way to get into Brisson, um, in terms of his style, I would uh, I, I would still stand by Alhazard Balthazar, um, and it it it's not as it's certainly not as bleak, it isn't exactly rosy either, but it's not as it's not as depressing, <laughs> it's not as bleak and it's not as dour as Mouchette. But, but having said that, um, if you're more inclined to that, or if you, if you find the, uh, if you find that you don't like overtly spiritual things, and it's not to say that Balthazar is overtly spiritual, it's just that I think you can extrapolate a lot of spiritual ideas and concepts from Balthazar. 
But if you're not interested in any of that, <laughs> if you're more of the existential route, uh, Machette would probably be more up your alley. Um, so, so yeah, Machette. And until next time, take care.